Hi everyone, uh, thanks for joining us today. We're really excited for you to be here, uh, joining the Scholarly Summer Writing Institute. And this is session one about developing your scholarly voice, how to paraphrase, make claims, and synthesize the literature. Uh, so my name's uh, Stacy Penna, I'm the QSR Community Director, and I'll be the moderator for the sessions. Uh, so what I'd like to do now is just um, introduce uh, our our uh, partners from Dissertation by Design. So I just like uh, to introduce uh, Jessica, the owner and one of the coaches. Yeah, thank you, Stacy. Hi, everyone. I am Jessica Parker. I'm the owner of Dissertation by Design. And uh, essentially, our company works with graduate students and early career scholars um, all over the world to help them design and conceptualize research that is methodolog methodologically sound, compelling and impactful, um, all while navigating the demands of you know, graduate school and transitioning into academia. We also offer one-on-one -on -one coaching services and on-demand courses, statistical consulting, editing services, and writing workshops um, for graduate students. Um, I am going to be presenting tomorrow on the art of self-revising. So um, I hope you can join me tomorrow, and I'm now going to hand it over to my colleague, Desi. Greetings to all, almost 500 of you at this point. <laughs> it's lovely to be with you. Uh, my name is Dr. Desi Richter, and I am a dissertation coach with Dissertation by Design. Um, my background is in arts-based research, and I have a doctorate in curriculum and instruction um, with an emphasis in writing pedagogy. So. I like to help people learn how to write, and I'm passionate about helping your research actually be your research. And I'm excited about today's session because your scholarly voice is one of the ways that you can really have ownership of the writing process, of the work that you are putting out into the world. And um, so I'm looking forward to helping you find some ways to develop your scholarly voice today. Great. Thank, uh, thank you, Jessica and Desi. And then I just wanted to introduce our software experts. Um, so for Satavi, uh, Jennifer Schultz uh, will be demonstrating. So um, Jennifer, if you want to say hi. Hi, everyone. Uh, looking forward to showing you Satavi. Thank you. And um, for Invivo, we have uh, Laura, who's one of our certified Platinum Invivo trainers, and she'll be showing you uh, how to use um, Invivo for your writing. Hello, everyone. Really looking forward to uh, seeing this presentation and wrapping it all up with Envivo. Thank you both. Uh, and here's just the description of today's session and uh, the agenda. So we're going to start with the dissertation by design. Um, Coach Desi going through how to enter the conversation, the power of paraphrasing, claiming and supporting, synthesis explanation for about 40 minutes, and then We'll then go for 20 minutes where uh, Jennifer will show us um, how you can use Satavi to help with that. And then Laura will show how uh, Invivo uh, will be used. And then uh, we'll take questions at the end. Uh, so with that, what I'm going to do is I am going to make uh, Desi presenter so that she can show her slide. So Desi, I'll do that right now. So there we go. Now, yep, now we can see them. Looks great. Beautiful. Well, welcome again. Um, I wish that I could just sit and talk with each one of you and ask you what it was that brought you to this time today, um, to the whole institute in general, but in particular to this session. And I can't do that, um, but we can go ahead and um, get into a little bit of this poll. We've sort of discussed the objectives, which were in the overview. So we'll just get right into it. And I think one of the ways to do that, if you wouldn't mind putting up the poll, is to get into a little bit of our feelings because as scholars you know we, we tend to think of ourselves as cerebral but we have feelings about this so could you go ahead and just answer this question in the poll which of the following words most describes your feelings about scholarly writing please select one of the following Ooh, okay so overwhelm, not surprisingly, is our top contender, but I'm, I'm kind of pleasantly surprised that there's some curiosity happening. And you know, you're gonna have these different feelings sort of mixed in 
throughout. And um, so what I'm gonna ask you to do, regardless of how you answered, is to come today and engage your one of your most powerful tools as a scholarly writer, which is your curiosity, your curiosity. And so please get comfortable. Just make sure that you're here, that you're present. And I'm really just gonna talk to you today um, and just kind of get into this idea of scholarly writing. Now, scholarly writing is a huge uh, topic. We could have a scholarly writing summer institute that lasted the entire summer. But in particular today, we're really getting into um, the ways that we develop our scholarly writing. And one of those ways is to think about the voice. So you can see here that it is a key element in effective writing. And when somebody, you pick up, ever pick up an article and you're immediately drawn to it, chances are it's something about the voice of the writing. And when you're hearing that writing in your head, you're hearing the person's voice. Um, I love this last part of this quote that says, voice is the music. Did you ever know that your writing has a sense of music, a sense of, maybe a sense of poetry even? Um, and then I put this picture here of a thumbprint because if we were all in a conversation right now and I knew you, I could know who you are simply by the sound of your voice. And as a writing coach, I you get to the point with a writer, you can tell who that writer is because of the voice. So this is sort of what voice is at a global level. And the thing that's a little bit different is here, you can modulate your own voice. You can whisper, you can yell, you can sound a little more proper, right? But it depends upon your purpose and often your audience or what we call the rhetorical situation. And Lisa Eid is drawing us to this set in such a lovely way when she says, whatever the rhetorical situation, the choices you make as you write and revise, and I want to slow that down, as you write, aka draft and revise, so come here Jessica tomorrow, will determine how readers interpret and respond to your presence. And these are just a couple of different, we would call them maybe modes of writing. And so in each of these, um, we may have the same writer making choices about that voice. And sometimes those choices can come in the pre-writing, it can sort of point our nose, which I'll be doing today, but they often do come along later on as, they re as we revise. It can be helpful to identify, this is one of my favorite little things to do with writers, is to think about what something is not, right? So if I'm looking at writing and there's a lot of big, big words when we don't really need them, or we often think in terms of our scholarly voice, everything just needs to be drawn out and sound super big and complicated for our reader so that I sound smart or pretentious. Or I'm not saying that we don't quote or that we don't use statistics, but if we see a lot of quotes just sort of thrown down brick by brick by brick or starting a lot of paragraphs with quotations and we're over quoting um, or we're not really framing our statistics, but we're just throwing them out there one after another, your voice is kind of like getting lost underneath those. So one of the things we'll do today when we get into the paraphrasing and some of our synthesis is to teach you how to not lose your voice and your point of view, um, which you are allowed to have as a scholar, um, by throwing all of these things in the way. So what is scholarly voice? Well, one of the huge things as a scholar is that Yes, you, you are making a point oftentimes, particularly if you are um, writing a dissertation, you're making a lot of claims, but you're doing so in an unbiased way. So for instance, I had a writer the other week that was talking about um, the checkered past of an organization. <laughs> I don't remember what the organization was, but her reader threw up a flag and said, that's biased language. Now another reader might not have. So we had to go in and think about what's checkered, were they, were they dishonest? Um, were they in some way, maybe, did she really mean disorganized, right? This kind of thing. When you are a scholar, and for those of you who are 
writing research, perhaps novice researchers, you are in the process of becoming an authority. And the way that you sound like this authority is this third bullet point. One of the hugest ways that we do this is that we make logical arguments that are claim driven, that are backed by evidence. And we also take time to understand the discourse in our discipline and we situate ourselves in that scholarly stream. So I see this often take place where I have two types of writers. I have the overclaimers who just throw down claim after claim after claim and I'm just writing next to it says who says who says who. <laughs> and then I have the underclaimers that are just quote, 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 quote. And to, I say, what do you think about this? So part of your scholarly voice is to learn how to not only summarize and paraphrase, but also learn how to wield source material in general well. And when you do so, you're still going to be you. You're just gonna be scholarly you. So here's what this can look like. Um, I'm talking here about the purpose and the audience. So I have a writing practice and every morning, um, I get up and I rant to my journal or I talk about what's going on. When I was writing my dissertation, I had an entry that went something like this. Not scholarly writing. And it said, it's me again, rambling on about the same bleep, <laughs> how this messed up testing regime is hurting teachers. I cannot believe what these teachers are going through. And I go on and on, you know, I'm just I'm ranting. And this is a perfectly valid kind of writing. And most of us, when we go over to the scholarly side, we, we know not to do that, but just look at it side by side, as this is really kind of almost a little seed of a problem statement coming out here, where it says, teachers who work in testing-centric contexts, man, can you see how I sat up taller and I, I even sound different? <laughs> teachers who work in testing-centric contexts indicate that they are dissatisfied with the ways in which they are required to teach. Specifically, Teachers in test-driven contexts have reported dissatisfaction with teaching scripted curricula. That's not a real study, y'all. That's just me showing you evidence. Rushing the pace of curricular delivery and teaching to the test. Teachers are not merely dissatisfied with these test-driven curricular approaches. In some contexts, they are experiencing extreme mental distress. So can you see that it sounds unbiased? Can you see that I'm integrating source material I'm making a claim about teachers being dissatisfied, and then I'm going in to specifically support that claim with evidence from other people. They're, they're fake studies, again, but you get the idea. One of the ways that we get into this type of writing is learning how and when to paraphrase. And I don't, I don't know why I called it the power of paraphrasing, but I think it is, I think it is a powerful tool to have. And most of us, I think at a general level, understand that when you're paraphrasing, you're taking somebody else's ideas and putting them in your own words, and you are citing them. So you can see here, I have taken the liberty of paraphrasing a quote, and I'll get it a little bit about why I chose to paraphrase it, but just take a second here and and read this, just read this to yourself. Read the top. And I'll read the bottom aloud. According to Nieto and Bode, see I'm signaling them. Hey reader, here comes somebody else's thought. When standardized testing is used as a way, oops, there's a word missing there, to track students, tests become vehicles of educational inequity. So again, saying the same thing, in a slightly different way. And you can see that in that second one, the writing just kept going forward. Every time you throw up those little quotation marks in the writing, what happens is there's a little register shift. You can almost hear it clicking in your brain. Go, go try reading something that's in quotes and you'll, you'll feel it. And so as we wanna just slipstream this writing out, when you paraphrase, um, you are keeping your writing going forward and you're showing people that you understand you have taken this source material, you have made meaning with it, 
and you are putting it into your writing. And here is like my little side note. Know why you are putting it in there. Ask of that little piece of material, what are you doing? Are you here to help prove a point? Are you here to help illustrate something? What, what's going on? Are you trying to bring a, a voice of an authority into the conversation in some way? Let us know. Let your reader know what's going on. I love little paraphrase passages because they can show up in all places in our writing, and you can see them here as main ideas, evidence, um, an analytical extender. It's something where it's like, a, um, it's not exactly a for instance, but it's, um, it's like to further illustrate, you can sort of bring them in and those can kind of act as examples. Sometimes you read something that's so confusing that you read it 12 times, and sometimes you have to leave some of that technical language in there because it's so precise, but other times, Again, going back to the first point, it keeps your writing moving forward if you can paraphrase. This is just a little example that I won't spend a lot of time on, but this is the idea that this is the same information about standardized testing being used as a way to track students and becoming vehicles of educational inequity. It's an evidence piece, and at the top, I turned it into a claim and then started elaborating on it. So, of course, we want to know, how do I know? I get this question all the time. I get writing where there's a quote and somebody will say, just paraphrase it. And they're like, well, how in the world was I supposed to know? I think that quite often we can actually paraphrase. And so you can look at this chart, but honestly, if you and some of us don't like to do this because we just want to get it done, right? We want to be efficient. But writing is an art. So sometimes you can write the sentence with the quote and then write it with the paraphrase. And if you're not losing anything much of the meaning or the flow of the writing, then go ahead and paraphrase. More often than not, we actually can paraphrase. And then when we do put those quotes in, they kind of, they're kind of shine like stars in the writing. So particularly on the left here, if you've got writing that is very vivid and strong, if you're a researcher and perhaps you've done an interview and you are bringing in a participant quote and you know that there was something about the way this person spoke that just maybe it got you right in the heart or you're like, whoa, that really is showing me something. And you need to say it that way, then quote. If you are calling on an authority and the person um, is famous or the quote is famous, right? To be or not to be, like what would we even par paraphrase that to be? I don't know, <laughs> right? Um, you, know, you just out, out, damn spot. What are we gonna say? Out, out, icky spot? Like it just doesn't work, right? We need to keep that material there. And um, when, Sometimes we have, particularly I'm thinking in quantitative research, um, you know, we just, we don't really need to worry about changing some of these findings. Now we might not give the whole sentence, but we aren't looking, like you don't need to try to find another word for significant. It's just significant, y'all. It just is what it is. But sometimes you just um, have that content, but, if somebody just said that something was super nice and fun and easy, you don't need to um, use those particular words. Okay, so let's play a game. Let's play to paraphrase or not to paraphrase. This first one is something a teacher actually said to me. When I teach to the test, I feel like I have an ax stuck in my head. So just think to yourself, would you use that as a quote or would you paraphrase it? I hope you're thinking quote. I'm thinking you're thinking quotes. This is some pretty vivid language. And now I'm thinking about how I'm using it. And so if I'm illustrating just how much standardized testing bug certain teachers, that is a quote I'm going to pull. Now here's a teacher that just, um, you can tell what my research was on, right? This, the use of scripted curricula is not best practice. It is not best for teachers or students and should be stopped immediately. Okay, 
I don't know about you, but that's not really standing out to me as particularly important. Um, or perhaps I would grab um, this and I would incorporate it into a sentence that says, you know, um, a teacher recently indicated that scripted curricula is not, quote, best practice, or that um, having to teach to the test is not best practice when using scripted curricula, something like that. But if I'm going to call to, uh, and rest in peace, Sir Ken Robinson, watch his TED Talk if you have not. Um, you know, he's just so known in my field. And he said, as children grow up, we start to educate them progressively from the waist up. And then we focus on their heads and slightly to one side. This one is not only an authority, but it has very, very vivid language. And it really, I can use this again to argue and illustrate points about the nature of education. But then this last one, I thought this one was kind of fun because Dr. Desi Richter said, and this is true, 100% of children in my home do not enjoy cleaning their rooms. Would you quote it or not? Would you paraphrase? Well, if you're thinking, you know, this is an authoritative voice, um, sure, I have a doctorate, but in this context, it's really just like mom talking. And again, think about, I don't know, the rhetorical situation does play into this, but I think this is more something that we could just say, you know, um, all of Desi's children, you know, do not enjoy or um, find that cleaning their rooms does not make them happy or is not a desirable experience. There's, and I could quote it, it's a, to me, it's a little more half and half, but I'm gonna go with that rule of like, let's just, Let's just not if we don't have to. Um, I had hoped to guide you through and have a little time to, to actually go through a passage. I, I think that for many of us, paraphrasing can happen intuitively, but you will get the video. And so what I would suggest you do is think about it in just, um, if you have an artistic practice or any kind of instrument you've ever learned, just set a few little practice sessions for yourself, short and sweet. Read it aloud, and then make sure you note your key concepts and terms. So you'll notice that in that example that I paraphrased, the words um, inequity, right? That, you know, or not equitable translated into inequity, like that was a key concept. <laughs> Sorting students, that's a key concept. I don't want to totally turn it into something else. And then when you're writing, you take notes and you write from the notes. I thought that was really interesting. So again, if paraphrasing is easy for you, fine. What you might need to do is spend some time trying to think about what you're going to do with this lovely little piece of information. What you're generally not going to do um, is just throw it out there for the reader with no framing whatsoever. Going back to the quote idea, particularly if you choose not to paraphrase, um, we don't want to see a float, like, like a stick in the mud in the middle of should I say float or quote? <laughs> I'm in New Orleans, we have lots of floats. Um, so you don't want to see the quote um, sticking up in the middle of your paragraph with no according to, or to illustrate, or further so-and-so noted that, and then your quote. Um, even if you put it in like that for as a placeholder, make sure you come back in this insert part, stitching your paraphrase and you're quoting material into your writing by knowing what your rhetorical purpose is for it will save your reader a lot of time trying to figure out what was going on in your head. So remember, scholarly writing, scholarly voice is clear, it's concise, it is more straightforward uh, because you're dealing with very complex thoughts and so we need to keep the writing clear. I wanna go ahead and move on um, I've sort of embedded the ideas of um, evidence and claiming and supporting into the synthesis section. So if you really were hoping for like a real clear, like here's your claim, here's your evidence, I decided to sort of marry these two um, because synthesis does involve 
in its final form, making some claims. And synthesis is really a skill that is going to show readers, hey, there's a scholar on the scene. There's not a summarizer on the scene. There's not a book report writer on the scene. This is somebody who has read, has studied, um, whether that study be text, whether it be um, a research where we're uh, talking with people or whether we're wielding data in a different way, you need to be able to synthesize. So we have another little poll here. So we have a lot of moderately prepared people, and I, I think um, this is quite often what we see, is that we are often told that we need to synthesize our writing or synthesize the literature, but we are not necessarily told how to do so. No, I had no idea what synthesis was. It was never mentioned once. Um, I wrote, and somehow it came to me that I needed to bring these studies together in some way, but I just I really, if you had said the word synthesis to me, I would have been like, are you talking about synthesizer? What are you talking about? <laughs> so brain souls that told me that you didn't know what it was, thank you for being honest, I appreciate it. Well, what is this thing that we're doing? At its core, synthesis involves taking two or more elements and I'm putting my hands together because we're, we're forming something new out of these elements. And you may wonder why I'm talking so much about the literature review, because synthesis does show up in multiple ways in a typical five chapter dissertation. But if you can get this concept and learn it in your literature review, which um, we recommend that you write first or very, very early in the process, then you'll have the skill at your disposal later on. So what I'm going to be showing you next is synthesis of literature. And I think that you'll be able to transfer that perhaps into other areas of your writing. So these elements are components of the literature that you gather and read. And then you hold it's the conclusion or it's multiple conclusions that you draw from these components because you don't just synthesize one time, you're synthesizing repeatedly and then telling the reader the results of your synthesis. But there is so much work of synthesis that happens prior to actually putting anything down on the page. And I think that you're going to see this later on when we get into the in vivo portion. And then the Satavi portion is going to help us um, also with some of these components that we're discussing as well. So uh, what I'm showing you is like the old school, the thinking that goes underneath synthesis. And then in vivo and Satavi can help you do those in ways that make you um, feel like a human being. <laughs> Imagine that technology that makes you feel more human by helping you save time. So I think I've made it clear that the new information that you, the reviewer, have discovered is going to come out in the writing. But it's happening with all of the reasoning and um, reviewing and critical analysis of the literature. And it's important to know that when you're looking at literature, if I am looking at um, testing literature and I am going to perhaps be doing a qualitative study or I want to get very deeply into the lived experiences of my particip participants, and perhaps you know that you want to gather some um, baseline data about new testing legislation and you're going to be running a big old survey on SurveyMonkey and all sorts of statistical correlations, our literature reviews will look different. I just I want you to let that sit with you for a minute because you're not merely reporting. You're not really going to start your paragraphs with in 2012, so and so did this, and then in 2014, so and so did that. And that's what I'm talking about here with 
synthesis, there I am back to the, the not definition. It's not reporting study findings one paragraph at a time. You do need to have summaries of your study. You do need to have an annotated bibliography or the forms of those things that you can have with these softwares but you're not going to simply spit those out onto the page and say, I have now reviewed the literature. No, you have reported the literature. I really want to hone in on the second one of these bullet points and the third one, um, because we're going to get into the how of these in a moment. You really are looking at groups of studies and the reason I have findings in quotes is that you're not even just looking at the findings or the, the themes that come up from the findings. You're actually going to be looking for trends and patterns and differences across all different components of your study. For instance, you may be looking at methodological trends. You may be looking at trends in who has been studied, what types of research questions have been asked. And in order to do that, you have to really be able to basically wield a big qualitative data set and be able to come to these types of understandings. This is basically saying the same thing a different way. So keep in mind patterns, differences, discrepancies. And a discrepancy isn't always just, um, you know, oh, the research is inconclusive or, you know, these research are out are out there and they're like duking it out all disagreeing with each other <laughs> you may have different findings but a discrepancy it kind of also put that in quotes it could be like a variety of approaches have been used a variety of participants have been studied a variety of settings so it's like maybe not all of the research is happening um, in in higher education alone maybe or, or, or in four-year institutions. Maybe it's happening in community colleges as well. Let me go back. But the thing that synthesis will help you do is once you understand the trends, then you're gonna be able to find out where the gaps are. You're gonna be able to infer from what is known, what is not known, and tell those things to your reader. And I just wanted this big and bold because now we're getting into, wait, how does this have to do with your voice? Well, I, the scholar, have read all of this, and now I'm gonna make some whole cloth claims about the literature perhaps as a whole, or perhaps certain subsets or pockets of the literature, or dropping down another level, maybe I'm making claims about certain ways that things have been approached in the literature. It, you get it, right? You are taking a position. And I just, I wanted this big because novice researchers, um, I know I was um, afraid to just say, this is what I think. This is the conclusion I have come to. This is the argument I am making. Yeah, right, but how? Okay. So you'll see here, um, we have an annotation table. And many of us are familiar with these annotation tables. Um, and I wanna highlight that these little parts and pieces up at the top, these titles, this is the information that you need to pull from the studies. Or I say pull, because old school, like here, you got a you got a study open on one side, you've got a table, you're copying, you're pasting, you're maybe paraphrasing and bullet pointing it, and you're putting all this information in. And there are um, other ways to do this <clears throat> later <laughs> that we can talk about. But take a look here. Not only are we looking at the results and the findings, but we're looking at how the study was designed. How did they collect data? How did they analyze that data? Who did they talk to um, going to our participants and setting? Often overlooked in this process is what theories have been guiding their research. So, you know, if you're looking for a theory, 
understanding what theories have been used and in what ways they have been utilized will help you perhaps even find the theory that you need, but that's a whole other conversation. What I'd like to draw attention to is that in this particular version of the annotation table, there are places for you in particular, this one on the right is how does this link to the study that I am proposing or conducting? Why is this article here? <laughs> Taking the time to go through this critical analysis at an individual level will help you as you move into the next step. Now, this is just an example of what a table looks like that's filled out. And of course, this is not all of the literature. I could not fit it all on the slide. So we need tools to help us manage it. And you can see that I've already begun doing a little bit of analysis um, just going down the columns, and I'm I'm coding those things in different colors. And the I'm going to go ahead to the next slide because I I wanted you to see this in a little bit more of a neat fashion. And so what I've done here is um, I've taken studies that are related to the topic of oral health curricular integration in um, higher education um, settings for healthcare faculty. That's a mouthful, so don't worry about that. But I have put them on this table. So I went in, I controlled F, and I got, and I'm just zooming in on these little sections. And this is where the studies are grouped. And I can tell you that they're even subgrouped a little bit. And the first two up here are really about looking at the um, perceptions and the, the barriers that healthcare faculty have to integrating oral health into their curriculum. These are not dental people. These are like doctor people, or as you can see, uh, physicians, um, excuse me, I'm stumbling over my words, family medicine faculty. The second three are subgrouped. These are interventions. And so you can see, let's just take this methodology column. I went through and I was like, okay, wow, I see. A similarity here. It's looking like people have really used a lot of quant. Sure seems like um, people also really like to use survey. <laughs> and so you can see that I've just I've chose these colors and I went down the table and if it was the same I put it in the same color. There's no magic to the colors but it helped me to sort of start make sense of this information. I still need to finish coding this um, over here with my findings and it looks to me that it would be coded this same kind of burnt orange color because these people are showing some success with these interventions that they are doing. Okay this takes a lot of time when you are doing it manually. It just does, but here's the analysis, and I'm I'm already beginning to get to synthesis, but to help me get there in the writing, um, we have created a synthesis table. And so what I've done is I've taken those codes that I found, and so let's go back over here for just a second. All that stuff that's in red, I just created a little sentence out of it, and I said, all studies employ quantitative methodologies, most often using survey and pre post test designs. Do you see how I'm not just talking about one study there? I'm making a claim. There's my claim. And then right underneath that, I have pulled in the references from that first column onto this table because that's going to be my supporting evidence. So when I get ready to write, I'm going to go back to that table, old school, and I'm going to show that what I said is true. And then I thought, well, wait a minute. That means if I infer from that, that there's necessarily a gap. Again, taking those five studies, um, there will be more studies in a, in a full bit review, but you get the idea, right? So why is that important? Well, I happen to know as the researcher that I'm looking to do qualitative research. And I know that I want to go in depth with these participants. And so, wow, 
no studies have utilized the qualitative approach. That's really important information, and I wouldn't have known it if I had not taken time to analyze the table. Now, not everything that is on this table will necessarily make it into the final writing, but this is a wonderful way for me to start thinking in terms of groups of studies. And in fact, all of the information on the annotation table is situated underneath one little um, pocket or strand of literature related to the overall topic of this particular dissertation. So I would um, go into this small little strand and I take some of this information, like for instance, this discrepancy that says that authors are brought here under finding the authors all use different methods to help improve oral health knowledge and then i could go up on this table um, i found wow well, three strategies three studies identified strategies to help participants integrate oral health competencies into their curricula this is good news just pausing for a moment I would like you to think about how this is going to lead you to not just start out saying what Berkowitz did and what Forbes did and what Glicken did. I'm sure it was all wonderful and they deserve a whole book on it alone, but I am framing their work underneath the group of studies and underneath this idea that relates back to my larger topic and I'm tying that up for my reader. And how do I do that? Yeah, exactly. How do I actually write this? Well, there are plenty of ways to do it, but one is this useful little structure called a meal plan paragraph. And I've, I've got this blingy bright coding here. It's gonna come into play in a moment um, because if we have a main idea, which would be one of these synthesis statements that are on this synthesis table, then what I do is I start pulling in the evidence in a paragraph, and then I offer the reader up a little bit of analysis about this evidence, and I can finish out that paragraph with a little link either back to something related to my study or moving forward in my literature review. And so, if you will follow the structure and do the work that precedes it in the pre-writing, you're gonna already be kind of moving towards making claims. Your synthesis statement or your main idea, while it can show up in other places, it, it often will show up as a main idea in a paragraph. So what does that look like? Well, you can see here at the top, I have pulled in my two synthesis statements from my synthesis table. And then what I did is I, I rewrote that into something um, that I felt like was a little more appropriate and kind of almost melded them together that says the following. Research has shown that a variety of teaching interventions effectively help healthcare faculty and students inter oral, integrate oral healthcare into their practices. Now, getting back to what Jessica's gonna get into tomorrow, this may not be my final sentence. Like the perfectionist in me right now is looking at that going, oh, I could have written a better sentence. Yeah, totally, but it's good enough for now. And so then I went back to my annotation table in, and I pulled from the annotation table the finding, the participants, and the methodology slash methods of this study. And I put that in. And from that, like imagine this on a page, I can now write. So I took that evidence and I'm like, okay, let me support this claim. And now you'll see that I have evidence, that's that same sentence. And I just took the stuff from those bullet points and I threaded it together. And I now have the same sentence about healthcare faculty and students integrating oral healthcare and that there are a variety of interventions. There's that discrepancy. 
and I now have evidence that says, this is where you might be going, when do I say what the study did? Right here. Utilizing an interprofessional oral health education curriculum model with physician assistant students, Berkowitz et al. 2015 demonstrated a 25% increase in oral health knowledge and clinical examination skills. Now, a lot of work went into getting that, but what I'm noticing as a reader is that the evidence there matches up the claim. It supports it. And I wrote that sentence in such a way that I put forward in the sentence the part of the information that related to the topic sentence. So does the reader, the first time I introduce a study, need to know a little bit about the study design? and who the people are. Yes. But I didn't write five sentences about that. I primarily kept the main thing the main thing. And then you can go back and just see that I, I did the same thing with Forbes. And um, down here, I have yet another method where I'm sort of putting these studies in conversation with each other. And now I have a claim and evidence. And this writing is, in fact, synthesized. I move forward. Um, the point of this is not so much to get into the analysis and the link, but I wanted to show you that after I put that evidence down, I came back in. Oh my goodness, who said that these findings are encouraging? This writer. <laughs> now, somebody might argue with my word encouraging, be like, okay, fine. So maybe the findings are something else. Again, this is what we'll talk about with my, my shitty first draft. But I'm like, wait, it's good news that we have all these different ways to help people integrate oral health care into their curriculum. Good. However, um, I'm linking this idea back to my study here by saying um, we need to understand what the healthcare professionals thought of these methods. Enough said. These little meal plan paragraphs. Um, really do often become a, a meat of a literature review. And so this process happens over and over and over again. And I just wanted to have it here for you in um, one place so that you can come back and rinse and repeat and, and understand how to engage the process. I've thrown a lot at you, so I just want to remind you that um, you really are drafting at this stage. And if you will be patient with the process of organizing and pulling study information, I would imagine some of you already intuitively know what some of the trends are. And you can even go back and look at literature and discuss it in these ways. But just remember, you're gonna go back and workshop these paragraphs to get to the more finalized version, you may end up figuring out how you want to paraphrase better or how to quote. At this phase, you're really just getting it all down. But you can see, let me just go right back up here. A thing to note is that this first um, sentence is not referenced. It's not. And the reason why is that this is your take. This is your voice as a scholar. I have had readers come in and make people reference this. And I say, fine, just reference the three people that are talked about in the paragraph. Not a big deal. But you're using the evidence to shore up what your understandings are. And um, I just wanted to leave you with that and encourage you to, again, relax. <laughs> And finally, um, this is just a little quick reminder that we have a literature review course that goes through these steps in depth because it, it's just such a process. So this is something that's also available if you need someone to just really model each and every step of the way with mentor text, then this course could be of use to you. And that really brings us to the end of this time. So we have a poll coming up synthesizing is the winner <laughs> it's probably not a surprise that that is not easy uh so so thank you i'm just going um stop the poll here you go
<laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, so I'm going to show you all now how you can build on what Desi was showing you and um, paraphrase and synthesize the literature in Citavi. So we'll look at some of the text annotation options you have. Um, that's just kind of our fancy terminology for note taking and how you can paraphrase with Citavi, how you can then add things to an outline. So adding categories, uh, add keywords, um, add custom fields so you can get at some of that information you would have in an annotation table. Um, and then uh, some of the advantages of doing it in Citavi rather than something like a Word file or Excel. Um, and we'll look at how you can start synthesizing the information in the knowledge organizer and then bringing that over to Word. Um, and in the handout, there's a link to a blog post that has some good information um, about when you might want to use something like Excel or Google Sheets for that kind of analysis and when you might want to use Citavi. Um, and with that, Stacy, <laughs> then uh, you can hand it over uh, to me again. I'll share my screen. And hopefully it's the correct one. Let's see. Are you seeing Citavi? I Good. am. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so this is Citavi. You have your list of sources over on the left. You have some information about them that you'll need for your citations in the middle. And uh, I have my full text over here on the right. And these are all journal articles. So uh, of course, that's a little bit easier than when you have a book, for example. Um, so what I've gone and done is kind of built on the examples in the presentation uh, before. And I've gone through and created some summaries and uh, quotations. And so let's take a look at that. Let's take a look at this direct quotation here. Um, I'll just show you how to do that. So let's delete this. And so while you're going through and reading, let's say you're now in the end of this article and you just want to pick out these statistics. What you can do is you can create a direct quotation. So you just need to highlight and then click direct quotation and it will add it. And usually the page numbers will come along as well uh, if they're in the metadata for the PDF. Um, sometimes you might see some things looking a little bit funny that can happen when uh, the PDF formatting gets a little off. So to fix that, there's a handy, uh, way to do that. Uh, remove paragraphs and tabs and sometimes it still doesn't work. So <laughs> uh, yeah, sometimes with PDFs, it depends um, on how that was set up. So every once in a while you have to go back in and clean up a little bit. So I've saved this direct quotation now, um, but of course, this would be a terrible thing to quote directly. It's um, just a lot of statistics and all of that. And probably what's interesting is what these numbers mean uh, for my lit review section that I'm working on. So what I might do here then is uh, go in now that I've created this quotation and then just change it over to an indirect quotation or a paraphrase. So I'll do that. I could have done that from the beginning too, but sometimes when you're reading quickly, you might just want to pull out the information you think is useful, and then you can always go back and work on it a little bit more later on. Okay, um, so here what's most important for me is that there was uh, this 25% improvement. So already I'm just going to put that in this field up at the top. Um, Oops. Citavi will auto-populate that field, but this is good practice to just change it. And um, kind of like with the old index card method, where when you're taking notes, you would put maybe the category or just a few short uh, words about the item you have saved, the text that you've saved. This is what this field is for. And it also is good for helping you remember what this is when you're looking through just hundreds and hundreds of notes later on and trying to bring that all together. Okay. And then I would just change that. Um, Oh, 
So something like that. Um, and then I can also add that already to my outline, which I've uh, predefined. Um, and I, you can see here, I only have a couple categories, but if you're writing a paper or a dissertation, this can be pretty complex and you can have multiple levels of categories pretty far down. But this is the beginning of this project, so only a few categories at the moment. I'll add it to my teaching interventions category. And then I'll click the check mark here. And you might notice uh, here I use the summary. So this, this one here is pretty much the same finding. You can use either a paraphrase or a summary. Um, the paraphrase I have linked to this exact statistic. So that's, that might be when you wanna do that. And the summary then would be about the results from the article as a whole. So in this case, you could use either one uh, depending what you want. And, in the second example, then you get the page numbers and you always have the link to jump back to the spot in the PDF. So we have a paraphrase now. Uh, let's look at some of our other studies that we have. Here I've just done a summary of the article. Um, here I've given uh, the whole article a comment. So this is with some notes for how this could link to what I'm looking at. And then this last one here is um, just linking then to the end of the PDF. And you can always click these links when you have them. These two aren't linked because they're about the article as a whole. But when you have them, it's quite handy because then when you're writing, you can always jump back to the spot where you found the information. Um, and then with this study as well, uh, just the paraphrase here with the findings and um, similarly here and for this one we haven't read yet. <laughs> so all of that information that we've been pulling from the different articles and usually of course you'd have a lot more um, pieces of information you're pulling out and comments you're making on the text as you read through um, but just for the purposes of this demonstration there's just a few for each article. So now if I go to the knowledge organizer in Citavi, what I can do is start pulling this information together and seeing where I have um, things that are similar or different. So I'm, I've taken these studies I have here and I've looked at you know, what are my main findings. And because I have this core statement for each one, I can see at a glance what those statistics were. Um, and then when I'm writing, I can pretty easily um, draft a paragraph where I talk about those different uh, statistics. And I've also created, you can see these things in bold here are the subheadings. So that just lets me group everything together. Um, in a nice, neat way. Um, you could consider using subcategories here too for, uh, for that information. Um, so that would be another way to get about it. Um, something like that. But here I've used these subheadings just because this isn't really um, a main section of my outline of my paper. So, um, here I just kind of want to stay a bit organized later on when I'm writing. So I'm going to delete this one then. And let's jump back again to our text that we were looking at, our different studies, and see how we can get at that annotation table idea um, of having some of that additional information. So in the quotations area, we've saved some of our own thoughts on the article and our own analysis uh, that we've just had from reading through it. And we can also save information about the study design, number of participants, methods. Um, for this, I've used custom fields because Satavi generally just has fields for the um, the individual uh, things that you would need to cite, but you can configure it so that you have the number of participants, uh, the type of participant, setting method, number of survey options, affiliation. You can make these, um, these fields also be uh, a list. So then when you're adding 
a new one, uh, let's say here I decided, oh, it's not a cross-sectional survey, you could choose from one of the other options that you have defined already. And that just helps you keep everything, um, keep the same language across. So you're not saying cross-sectional survey in one spot and then, um, uh, yeah, I don't know, <laughs> intersectional study or something <laughs> in another section. Uh, so th then you have, um, yeah, that nice drop down that makes it a little faster to input the information. And the advantage of using Citavi over something like Excel is that you have a lot more search options. Um, so you can combine pretty much any aspect that you're looking for. Um, so if you have methods and you, you want to look for cross-sectional studies, um, and that would just be our custom field. You see you have really every field in Citavi is, is searchable. Um, so let's go down to our methods. And we might say cross-sectional survey. Oops, helps if you spell it correctly. <laughs> Although you can use wildcards if you want to get at alternate spellings. And we have some examples over on the right. Um, and then maybe I'll want to say something like, um, let's see, a keyword. Um, and I know I'm looking for uh, a quantitative study. And if I search for that, uh, it'll bring back those two items that I marked as quantitative and that, had, that were uh, cross-sectional surveys. And you can then uh, apply those as a selection and look at those together. So you have a nice way of just getting, getting subsets of your references and seeing where you have similarities, uh, where you have differences. You can um, look at which items don't meet those criteria. So you just would click on that um, search uh, uh, terminology here and then click the arrow, which will invert the search. And then you would see all of the items in your project that don't meet those criteria. Um, so that's one advantage. Of course, when you're adding references as well, it's a lot faster because Citavi will look up the information for you. Um, so if we were, um, pulling information from a database or we had these PDFs saved on our desktop, we can just drag them into the column here and they're imported and Citavi will look up all of this information. So then you don't have to type it in by hand. It also helps you be consistent because you, know, you don't have to uh, type up the year a, a few different times and a few different analysis tables. You always have it linked to linked to any quotations that you save so that when you cite it, all that reference information is just pulled from the project. You don't have to have it in multiple places. Um, and uh, another reason to, to consider Citavi for a lit review is that you can quickly jump back to the context of a quote you pull. Um, so if I'm here in the knowledge organizer and then I want to see, okay, what were, uh, what was the context here? Uh, and I can click on this core statement and then I'll just see that information over here on the right. Um, then I can just jump back using that link symbol. And of course that looks a little bit small so I can move things around so I can see that a little bit better. Uh, so you can zoom in and, and change the layout in Citavi. Um, I'll jump back to the knowledge organizer now and here, uh, you'll notice there are a few light bulbs as well. These are thoughts. And so sometimes you might be uh, looking at your uh, critique, uh, some other notes you've taken. You know, I pr probably have quite a few notes on these different studies. And then um, that might spark a new idea. So you can compare different different uh, pieces of information and ideas that you've saved over here in the preview. And then if something sparks a thought, you would just add it using this uh, thought option. And then you can give that a category as well. Um, so for example, here I have my analysis and um, 
what I think, you know, about that. And of course, this is written pretty shorthand. I've got some arrows in here. Um, this isn't yet very scholarly uh, sounding writing, but that's okay, because at the moment, I'm more interested in just getting these thoughts um, saved and, and kind of put on, put on paper <laughs> or put on the screen. Um, because then what you can do is take all of that to Word, and uh, this is just a recreation of that um, meal example. So that synthesized text that shows, um, you know, th these different studies. And I've inserted them with Satavi. Um, I'll just show you how that works. And this, of course, uh, is uh, just a author year style. So APA in this case. You can change the style up here uh, just by going to add citation style. And let's say I want to insert that one reference now so I can do that. So I just double click to insert it. Oops, this isn't exactly what I want. I want a different format. Um, so to do that, you can just go to insert advanced and then choose person year. And then that's going to put it in, um, in that um, that order that works within the sentence. And what Satavi will do as well is it will create a bibliography automatically. And just refresh that because sometimes it gets a little bit slow if it's been sitting for a bit. Um, yeah, so th there then you'll see all of your uh, references that you've inserted in your paper. And then you um, don't have to do any of that by hand. Satavi does it for you. And if you ever have to change a piece of information, like maybe you see, oh, I spelled that author's name wrong, uh, you can go to edit in Satavi, jump back to the reference, and then um, change the, oops, there it is, uh, change the author name, and it will update in your Word document as well. And you can see it updated it right away. Um, and as you're going, one thing that can be quite handy is to use the chapter view. You'll notice that it's empty right now. And we can change that by inserting our category system. You can insert all of your notes at the same time. But usually, I like to just leave those out and insert the categories. And then as I'm going, I can look into um, a specific section. So for example, teaching interventions, if I go to this chapter view, you can see now that you have all of your references you've saved under that category and all of your knowledge items. And for this particular paper, <laughs> we haven't done anything in the other categories. So those are all blank. But then we would have this information here and you see with the check marks what you've already cited. Um, and you can use this also for when you're um, adding your analysis of research results. So let's say here then I want to add um, my critique. What I can do is look at what my notes were down here on the left. And then I can see, uh, for example, what, um, uh, what I wrote about this particular study. And I also can look at my ideas. So I've designated this with my analysis. And that's why I can easily find something that I know should go at the end of this section. Um, or for example, here, I've identified a gap in the literature. So I could insert that. And for these ideas, you can just double click to insert. And then you can. Um, change them as needed. So for example, here, uh, I might decide, yeah, I want to rephrase that. And um, so I would maybe change that around a little bit. So I just uh, pre-typed that up before so you didn't have to watch me typing. <laughs> so you could then um, just start um, looking at, at what you have over on the left and then rephrasing that um, in a way that, that sounds good for, for your paper. And for this one as well, then I might say something like this. So that's, uh, that's basically how you can use Satavi then to, to take information from your readings 
and then compare them um, to pull out information that's important to you for comparing and contrasting studies and then how you can add your own ideas uh, and your own comments on the literature and kind of bring that all together in Word. And so this can just be a nice way of helping with um, avoiding writer's block <laughs> because if you do some of that analysis in Citavi and just start grouping things and figuring out how things fit together and it's a bit like doing a puzzle, then when you go to Word and start writing, it's a little bit uh, less intimidating of a process because you're not trying to do it all from there. Um, so similar to the annotation table, but just with some additional advantages that it's a little bit easier to uh, to create more advanced searches and uh, you can always easily jump back and view the context of uh, one of these pieces of information that you want to cite. Okay, I'm a little over time, but uh, <laughs> I think, uh, Stacy. then you can uh, proceed with the, uh, the next part. Yep, no problem, but thank you. That was very helpful. And I've shared some questions um, mm -hmm. with you that if you can help answer them, that'd be great. And Laura, sure. I'm making you a presenter now. Okay, yeah. you're seeing yep. it now? Yes. Okay, Vivo. great. Yes. So today I'm going to take you a little bit through um, what Envivo can do in addition to thinking about things the way that Desi has uh, set up and presented things. Also, I bet you're starting to think about all of the ways that Tavi can help you with your uh, lit review. And I'm going to take you today through uh, just a sample project that's built into Envivo, the new version of Envivo. And I wanted to show you this sample project because Certainly in the last uh, few minutes, we don't have time to do all of the things that I'm going to show you, but you'll be able to go back and look at this project as a good reference for things that you may wish to do in your own lit review. And often when I talk to people about using NVivo for the lit review, this hasn't occurred to them. They think of NVivo as a qualitative data analysis program and haven't necessarily thought about using it as part of their literature review. But when you think about some of the tasks that even that we've seen today and many of the things that we do in a lit review, it's very similar to qualitative data analysis. You're reading for meaning, you're grouping for themes, patterns, maybe beaten by author or year and so on. And then you wanna bring it all together in a place that you can think about it, synthesize it and uh, write up your report. So I'm showing you the welcome window of the new version of NVivo in the Windows version. And in this little window here, you can find more sample projects. And if you click on that um, window, it will take you to a place where you could download, whether for Windows or Mac, this project that I'm going to run you through now. So in the interest of time, I'm not going to take you through how to do any of these things. I am going to plant some seeds for you to come back to this project and think about some of the things that you could do with NVivo when you're thinking about a literature review. So as we've heard already, organizing the literature is one of the biggest challenges. And one of the things that I think is really helpful about NVivo and using it for literature is that you can begin to organize your literature in ways that make sense to you. Potentially, you want to organize it um, according to methods or perhaps the type of study, or maybe you have some different categories of things that you're thinking about. But when we bring our information into NVivo, we can set up folders to help us organize our data and or our files. So on the left hand side here in this blue bar, we can see a list of all of the folders um, that are created in NVivo. And the folders system is a really great way to organize your information. And this researcher has created and, uh, a system of organizing the literature by the type of articles. So empirical articles, web articles, blog posts, and so on. So if I wanted to think about how to set up my literature review, thinking about maybe the groups that you can create in Citavi. Jennifer didn't show it, but you can create groups in Citavi. That may be a way that you want to organize your literature when you come back into NVivo. So this project is a mature project, has many um, examples in it. And, uh, but if I wanted to actually bring something into the um, project, I would create a new folder and I would call it probably something other than new folder, but to show you the process, I'm gonna just show you here. And I would go into my new folder 
and I would actually import the articles. Now, notice if I have a folder open, like this empirical articles folder, what opens in this window is a list of all of the articles that are saved in that folder. And notice also that if I click on an article, I can see it. It's going to open for me on the right hand side. I don't really want to see those bookmarks. And I can have more than one article open at the same time. So when I'm starting to think about what's common across articles, what's different across articles, where you know you can actually toggle back and forth between the articles in this kind of way. So let's go back to that new folder I created. And perhaps I want to bring some other articles into um, my project. If I have them saved already on um, a file folder or something in my computer, I may simply just want to bring in the PDF. And to do that, I would go up to Import, Files, I would navigate to where I have them saved, and I would import them that way. Conversely, if I have them saved as part of um, bibliographic software like Citavi or Mendeley or some of the other ones, I could go to the program that I'm using, let's say it's the Tavi, and I would export the references that are of interest to me, including the files if they're attached to that. And then I would go down and find that um, export, and I would click on it to import it back into NVivo. And if I'm going to do that, you'll see that a window comes open and it gives me some options about how I want to import those files into NVivo. And I'd like you to notice that you can you know, store them in certain places, you can attach uh, memos that are created from the abstract and so on of the articles that you're bringing in. So that's how you would go about doing those things. And then once I have my articles in NVivo, what I'd want to do is code them. And coding is the process of where we're actually reading for meaning and putting things together that belong together. And we might code for a number of different things. Uh, if you wanted to code according to the annotation table that um, you know Desi was thinking about, you could potentially uh, set up code structure that mimics that, or you potentially just want to go in and code each of these kinds of sections of your uh, papers, the methods, so that the methods are all together. And at a glance, you could open your code. I think it's going to open. Let's try that again. And see all of the, um, there's some lag there see all of the method sections of all of your papers all in one place. So often, though, we're interested in coding by topic. And in that kind of um, system, then you might be thinking about the categories that you've set up in Citavi that um, are part of your paper that you're writing, the lit review section, and so on. And here you see that the top level code is kind of a theme about mental health applications. This project is about virtual reality and health. And you may want to um, then have subcodes for things that are related to mental health applications. So you'll see them all kind of set up this way. So you can code manually simply by opening a file. And then I, since I have one open, and the process of coding is simply, I would be reading something. I'm going to just pick something here to show you the process. I'm not reading meaningfully. And I, once I have that passage selected, I could code that selection either to some of the codes that already exist, or I could create a new code. So that process of manual coding is extending your literature review and helping you think about and group together things that belong together that are of interest to your your, eventually your research study, but certainly for the lit review part. In NVivo for Windows, you can also do something that's called auto-coding. And in auto-coding, you select a list of files or one file or something like that. And you come up and you can ask NVivo to identify the themes that it sees in the literature. And in that process, it runs through and generates a list of themes. And when you get the themes back, it creates codes that are kind of looking like this, auto-coded themes um, by phobia. And then Vivo has gone through and gathered together all of the references that are about anxiety and put them together in one place or um, exposure or fear, et cetera. 
So I would not say that your coding is um, for themes is done when you run this process, but it can be a great double check if you're wondering, hmm, how often does this show up and so on. But what I wanted to show you uh, even more importantly, I think, is when you actually have, and this works in NVivo for Windows or for Mac, perhaps you actually, before you've even done any of that coding, you're interested in certain things that come up frequently and so on. What you can do here is actually come up and do a query for these oops, these items. So I would select my list of items, and I would ask NVivo to do a word frequency query, which then generates a list of the most frequently used words in that item. And you can also have NVivo look for certain words or phrases by running a text search query for a word or phrase. So if you have um, an interest in what's being said most frequently, this word frequency query returns a table with most frequently used words. And you can actually select one of those words and run a text search query, which would let you look for that word across all of the articles you've selected and put it in one place. I'm um, not going to show you more about those, but now that you know where the sample project is, you can come in and try some of these yourself and then um, start to think about the ways that you can use that word frequency query and the text search query back and forth, maybe even before you've done any coding, but potentially later on as you're starting to get ideas and then wondering, oh, does this word come up a lot? Does this phrase come up a lot? And look for that specifically. Last little bit I wanted to show you was that you can use and make notes um, in what is called memos in NVivo. Um, remember that I said the abstracts of articles can be imported as memos. Uh, if you're thinking about using memos to summarize some of the information that you have um, been thinking about, this memo you could create as a template. This kind of mimics one of the tables that Desi was showing. And you can begin to systematically note each of these kinds of things about the studies that are most relevant uh, for your project. So the last thing I'd like to finish with is it's great to have your literature and your data in the same project because once you've got that literature summarized and then you start to do your analysis and are getting ready to link the two back and forth, if you've got it all in one place, you can easily start to make and create uh, links between that um, and memo that, and by the way, any of these memos can be exported as Word documents, which then allow you to have Word documents as the basis of your reporting. So that's a quick um, overview of some of the things you might want to do. Do come back and have a look at that sample project, and Stacey, I'm handing it back over to you. Awesome. Great job, Laura. I know it's always hard going, uh, going last, <laughs> so thank you. Um, and um, Laura also had a slide, so you have that in the handout, just about what she went over. Um, I'm just going to go over some quickly uh, resources, and then we, we'll stay on a little more for questions, but um, uh, the presentations are all very good, and it's always hard to get, um, oh, I think I did the wrong one. Uh, shoot, uh, sorry. Um, I want to duplicate, okay. Um, so here are some uh, resources. So Dissertation by Design is a live a link to their website, and they do all this fun stuff to help people with their writing. Uh, this is just a, a visual showing how you can use Citavi and Invivo throughout your writing process. So it's some of the things that um, Laura and, and uh, Jenny went through with you. Uh, if you want to try Citavi, we got a lot of those questions. We have Citavi 6 for Windows trial, and Citavi Web um, is it's cloud-based, so it can be used for Windows or Mac, and it's a 30-day trial, so go ahead and, and check that out. And then there are a ton of really good resources to help you learn Citavi here um, at the website. Uh, and here's just how you can um, use NVivo throughout your research process and the different products we have. And again, you can trial NVivo here and our uh, different projects like transcription and, and NVivo Collaboration Cloud for Teams. Uh, here's some resources, so free resources to help you get started. Um, if you want to learn more about how you can use NVivo for a lit review, we do have an, uh, a webinar showing that, so you can find that there. And then here are some courses you can take to learn um, NVivo. 
uh, and I'm part of the community, it'd be great if you joined, if you haven't already. Um, and we do have our conference coming up. So I really want to um, promote that and our call for abstracts are due June 30th. So please, um, you know, submit your abstract. We'd love to get it for you. And the conference is in September. And just an announcement, our career our research grants coming up, um, early career researcher grant, and they're looking uh, for uh, reviewers. So that's all in the handout. So I'm going to stop there and see if uh, Jessica, any maybe take like two questions for Desi. Uh, oh, hi Desi, yeah, absolutely. Desi, can you see the questions on, on your end? I cannot see them. That's okay. I have them here. I think Stacy forwarded them to me while you were presenting. And I responded to some of these, but they're really good. So I think sharing them with the, with the group would be helpful. So one question that came up is how do you address the perfectionism that comes up um, when paraphrasing? And this particular person said that they're worried about not capturing all the details of the original quote. Um, and they feel anxious uh, when they paraphrase because they worry that they're leaving things out. Well, I think that that's where the process comes in because I, even in preparing for this presentation, that's not a process that I've used. I think that if you um, really code for the key concepts that are in the quote and then start thinking about synonyms for those or how do you say that in a different way, um, then you can do that. And then the other thing is, I think. Um, something we don't do enough of in writing communities is have someone else take a quick peek at what mm -hmm. we've done. Obviously, you can't do that every five minutes, but if you're really concerned about it, um, then have me go, does this seem like it's basically saying the same thing to you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's nothing quite like, there's no shortcut. It, it's my kind of private response to her was, it just takes time. And I think your confidence will grow as you do it and you get positive feedback from you know whoever might be reviewing your work. Um, obviously getting a peer to review things if you're really nervous about it and really unsure, um, getting just another a separate set of eyes. But I do want to mention in order to kind of fight that perfectionism and this is something I'll touch on tomorrow, is in the initial drafting process if you're really in the flow of writing, then just go ahead and drop in the quote. Don't force yourself in the moment to try to paraphrase if you're if you're on a roll. Um, because then if you just kind of allow yourself, I find that if you try to do it in the moment, it tends to be too rushed. And that's when you might make, be more likely to make a mistake. So when you're drafting, just drop in the quote if, if it's slowing you down too much to try to paraphrase in the moment. And then during the revision process, really spend the time to kind of re-familiarize re yourself with the quoted material, revisit the original text um, in a scenario where that's the goal, that's the purpose of that session. I think that can be helpful too. Good. Let's see, we have another, that's a, a, another variation of that question. I thought this was interesting. So why is paraphrasing important when we're referencing the writer? I think it gets back into um, the idea of what it does to your writing mm -hmm. when you are um, potentially over quoting. So mm -hmm. again, the, it's like you're stitching in these thoughts and they're being embedded into your thoughts. And so you're using this material to do lots of different things in the writing, often to illustrate something, to give credibility to what you are saying, but keeping in mind again that you are saying it. And so it's not that you always want to paraphrase, but it's, it's that decision tree of asking what is the, the benefit of a quote here versus a paraphrase? And so that's why that table is in there, going back to the list of, is the writing really vivid? Is there something about this person that people would kind of know their words? Or is it is it gonna get in the way of the clarity of the writing, of the momentum of the writing, if we choose to quote? Because it really does, I really meant it, like it slows you down, there's a little, like, Glitch almost that happens 
when you have, a, especially if you have a long block quote that's coming mm -hmm. in in the middle, it's like it almost comes to a standstill. Yeah, I tell my students, my doc students, I teach a lit review class. I cannot remember the author who said this, but I read this somewhere. I think I was in the or like the first year of my doc program, and the author said, you should only use the quote if it's like the voice of an angel. And basically, if there is no possible way you could say it differently or better, then use the quote. Um, and, and that holds true. I, it's a sign to me, it's a red flag if I receive a document from a student and it's full of quotes. That immediately tells me that they are not confident paraphrasing, that they're not confident enough, they're not sure enough about the writing to put it in their own words. Um, and so I, I think that um, referencing needs to happen whether you're paraphrasing or using a direct quote. Um, yeah, perfect. Say though that we focused a lot on the literature review, but those examples where you know you're particularly if you're doing qualitative research and you're trying to bring in the voice of participants and perhaps these are working with people who have been marginalized and haven't been in the conversation, then mm -hmm. I would care err more on the side of letting these very, very vivid quotes get us into the thick description and the experiences of these participants. Yeah, I agree. I think of that quoting as completely separate from synthesizing literature, building you know, the rationale or the significance for your research when you need to bring in evidence from other researchers, just err on the side of paraphrasing. Uh, let's see, let me find another question. Uh, one person asked, what's the typical number of articles to include in a qualitative review on the lived experiences of patient care? And I privately responded to this person and I said, there is no secret magic number. I get asked this by almost all of my doc students when I teach the lit review because the answer is it depends and they're not very happy with that response, but it truly does depend on the research topic, how topical is it, how much literature exists on that topic. Because even if you're choosing, like we have some students and some clients who are honing in on research related to COVID-19. Sure, this pandemic is very recent. Does that mean you have a three page lit review? <laughs> because there's not a lot of literature yet within your discipline on the pandemic? No, you, you then have the job of finding these parallel contexts um, so that you can include literature so you're able to compare and contrast the results or findings of your study. So I don't know if you have a, another insight to share, Desi, but the answer is it depends. No, I'm completely in agreement with everything <laughs> that you just said. Yeah. Some people think, oh, if I choose a very kind of novel topic, maybe I can have a briefer lit review. And I think it, it can actually make your job a little bit harder. So don't fall into that trap. So um, just because of time, we're probably going to have to end it there. Uh, we have more questions. Um, so we'll share the questions uh, with Jessica and Desi too, and, you know, in case there's something they can answer um, offline. Uh, but we just want to thank everyone. It's been a great session today, a lot of positive feedback. So uh, thank you, Jessica and Desi, and also Laura and um, Jenny for showing us how the software can be integrated. The idea with software is uh, just to help hopefully make life a little easier for you. <laughs> so hopefully we showed that.